Hi everyone. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for attending our talk, uh, Surviving from Endless Issue, coming from 7,000 plus uh, Kubernetes clusters. First of all, I'm very excited to be here uh, because it's my first time abroad uh, in three years since COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, my Korean name is Sogyong Hong, uh, but you can call me uh, just Dennis. Uh, I'm a cloud native cell reader at Kakao, developing a private cloud. And I'm Wan He. I'm also from Seoul, South, of South Korea. And I'm also working as a cloud engineer at Kakao Corporation. And first time in North America, and KubeCon, also for KubeCon as a speaker. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> now, despite the enormous size of uh, Kubernetes clusters, I believe many of us here uh, do not know what company this is. Uh, Kakao is the mobile life platform company that serve messenger, portal, bank, mobility, commerce, webtoons, and more. Uh, we cannot say everything here, so if you're curious, visit kakaocoff.com for more information. One of thing in common is that all of them are internet service that need a server. As you can guess, most of the services in Kakao are running in Kubernetes now. We started our transfer from Apache Mesos to Kubernetes in 2080, and 99% was complete this year. When we decided to use Kubernetes, there were many concerns about how to provide Kubernetes to in-house developers. The biggest consolation in adapting Kubernetes was whether to provide a single large cluster as a tenant for namespace or provide separate clusters for each organization or service. We consider various factors such as cluster management, resource efficiency, security, freedom of development, etc. In conclusion, we decide to provide lots of small clusters because isolation and security guarantees are essential requirements for compliance. So we developed our own private Kubernetes service to provide the Kubernetes cluster to in-house development uh, developers in an automated way. It's called DKOS. It only, take, uh, it only takes three steps to get a new Kubernetes cluster, login, set cluster names, and select region, and done. And this year, we will create Kubernetes clusters not only in Kakao's private clouds, but, only, uh, but also in public clouds such as AWS. Delivering a Kubernetes cluster in automated way while ensuring High isolation and freedom through self-service has a both good news and bad news. Good news is uh, the number of Kubernetes clusters grow, grow successfully, and more than 7,000 plus clusters are operated. Bad news is so did our own core issue are. We have moved the cloud successfully by delivering automated Kubernetes service. This approach has advantage of e easily creating a Kubernetes clusters and meeting individual requirements, but also has this advantage of being too easy to make one and causing various edge case and the Growth of operate, operational cost is barely manageable.
ทุกทุก Let's talk about bad things further. First, too many clusters are not being used. Developers made their cluster for production service, developing, testing, or whatever reasons. The problem is that they do not delete, delete it, even though their purpose is done. It is okay if we have a countless server in a data center with infinite space, but sadly we do not. And someone might think that, then why just find them out and delete all of them? First, we do not expect our service grows this far, so we do not have useful metadata for this task. Second, determining whether this cluster is in use programmatically is not an easy task. For example, the cluster use, using less than 10% of CPU could be a cluster not being used, but also could be a production CDN service, which just using less CPU. And the cluster having no deployment could be unused cluster, but also could be a cluster used by a bunch of custom resources. The point is that we have exceptions for every criterion, so we have to consider multi multiple factors. The second problem is that we've got anchor issues that are very manageable. This is an example of our anchor request. It basically said, good morning, some of our pods are, restart pods are restarted at 5 a.m. We've got notifications for that, but we don't know why, so can you help us? Uh, that's the request we received, and the reason can be anything starting from uh, an application bug to known Linux kernel issues. And we have to find out the reason from scratch every time. What we did with this half year of 1,000 plus on-core data was conducting a research. To be more specific, we conducted research based on ground, grounded theory including open, exterior, and selective coding techniques. So one thing I want to share from this research is, that, is the fact that not all developers do know where about Kubernetes. For example, we all know that using the container image tag latest could be cause unexpected version of container being run but this happened frequently, and they ask us why some of their pods are running unexpectedly, or using the host path, host path to store some critical data, something like MySQL database, and creating new VM to scale up, and ask us why their data is gone. All these issues could be fixed just by saying, hey, you have potential problem here. You'd better fix it now. But the problem is where we have 7K plus clusters, and it's never been a good idea to do it manually. So what we need is someone or something other than us. The rust problem is that we forget what we know after a few years. This graph show how we handle our issues. When the issue can be handled by a user them, themselves, we just show manual or documents to handle by themselves. If it is an administrative request, such as increasing quota or allowing public IP, we just allow or disallow, and the rest of things are processed automatically. If the thing is non-issue, we'll label it an instant. If not, we mark it as a problem. When we find the reason for the problem, we write some documents and share it with our list of Encore members. But sharing knowledge or documenting is always a challenging task. So at best, after a few years, we forget it and try to find reasons for once known issues again. Even though we have operational tools like chatbot and monitoring tools, this is not enough for these situations. What we needed was a detection as a code. 
to examine multi to examine multi factors for deleting clusters to let users know what could be a problem with a human intelligence and to find known issues automatically without waste of time. So we made a DTAC short for detecting Kubernetes known issues, which is an extensive problem detecting command line interface tool for reliable, reliable Kubernetes cluster operations and rapid problem detecting made by Go and Thanks for taking photo of this, but I can show the link. Yes, we open source it, and you can find it on github.com slash cacao slash detect. And this is how we use the tag. Wait a moment, please. Uh, yeah, before starting the demo, this is our in-house service. So this demo will show a lot of Korean, but don't worry, open source version of DTEC does not have single letter of a Korean and alphabet. So yeah. So this is our list of clusters that I can have access, and we will use cluster name Scotty Scott, which is my English name and requesting a new analysis, diagnosis, running, done. You can see the result of diagnosis. And as you can see, there's fatal error and wrong things. And there's a pod, pod with no selenium endpoints and service with no operable pod, which is detect server, you know. And we can see the pod restarted frequently, which is 12,000 times. Oh, God. And we have outdated TLS certifications, which is outdated 53 days ago. Yeah, this is what Detect did, and that's all. It finds the known issues which frequently happened and show, say, user to act something. Or with further automation, we can do something automatically that can handle by automatically. Sorry, no words. <laughs> and yeah, Detect has a pretty simple internal structure from variety sources like Kubernetes, Prometheus, SSH, or whatever can access. Components core collector in Detect try to get something like pod manifest, deployment manifest, Prometheus metrics, and infra status. And save it to in-memory in -memory key value storage in Detect and series of components called detector try to find useful insights for us. Something like TLS certification will be expired soon, or some of pod restarted more than millions times. Lastly, final report is generated in a form of JSON or YAML for further automation, or can be seen as an interactive form of HTML. But both collector and detector components are extensible, so you can add or remove whatever rules suitable for your environment. Uh, now I show you a demo for creating new rules for detect. Let's say you are in a situation where deploying more than 10,000 pods will kill you, kill your control plane, and want to detect to such situation, we are going to show how to add a new detector called no more than 10,000 pods. And 
and this is my VS code. Here's the repos the cloned repository of the tech. And as you can see, there's the directory called cases and detector, what I just said. And I'll make some detector rule called too many pods. Starting here. Type too many pods. And some type hinting for VS code. Uh, implements the, this interface, and you can see the detector detector is consists of two methods, which is called get meta and do for doing it. And in a get meta, you can define some informative things in here, something like id to many pause description more than 10,000 pod will kill your control brain by um and so if happen, its level will be one, and it if happen, you have more than And we need something like, uh, we need some data from collector called pod list. Uh, which is type of pod list from Kubernetes. And yeah, that's the order, order thing that you need in get meta and to detect if there is actually the more than 10,000 pod, you can uh, sorry, detect typing. I want to get some pod list from context get collector. Give me pod list. And you will get pod list. If error, I'll not handle this now. And just return the report, which is, which is, has passed if length of published items is less than 10,000. And doesn't return the error. Yeah, that's the order, order things that you need to define a new detector. And I will show it right now. We need to detect this one and go Currently, my laptop it have connected with Kubernetes, which has two worker nodes, and I run this time. Sorry, uh -oh. I run and export our reports as HTML. Open it. Yeah, and this is what you get as a research reports from DTEC. And as we just defined it, there's a rule saying too many pods. 
in current state is everything is normal, but there's no informative anymore. Oh, sorry, I forgot something. Uh, yeah, to add some debug information. Description, shovel, pause, data, land, polymers to item. Generating report, open it. Uh, yeah, there's a rule called too many pods detect nothing and there's a total of 56 pods in this cluster. And if there's more than 10,000 pods, their label will be warning and ask user to delete some unused pod immediately, hopefully, please, whatever. And yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, detect has pretty simple structure as you saw, just saying some meta and some rules to define what is the problem. You can do such a things like connect via connecting each node via SSH and check some kernel parameters, or checking the container images from unknown registry, or check wound killed pods. Yeah, such a thing. And yes, that's all. Hope, sorry, I missed my scripts. So I just saying something. And yes, hope this helps Kubernetes users to use Kubernetes more effectively. And thanks for coming and listening. Yeah, that is done. <laughs> Any question here? Yeah. Hi, thanks, thanks for the really good talk, you guys. Um, I was wondering, uh, I, I took a look at the repo and there are uh, maybe half a dozen, 15, six or seven, 10 detection rules or something in there. Are you planning on publishing more detection rules? Because I'm sure you've got a lot from your operational experience. Yeah, in in house we have currently more than fifty rules in there. But oh, repeating the question, he said if the there's currently a six detector rule in our public GitHub repository, and he asked me, did you have any plan to expand it more, adding more rules for that? And my answer is yes. In in-house, we have more than 50 rules for detectors, but yeah, we don't have time to <laughs> <laughs> evaluate whether is this fine to open source it or we have to constrain it. Yeah, that is the decision problem. And yes, we have planned to add more rules in this year. Hey. Uh, just a quick question. So uh, for your scroll scripts, uh, since they're accessing uh, some of those uh, Kubernetes resources, are they deployed externally outside your cluster? And if so, like how do you go about deploying it? Oh, sorry, my English skill is very poor. So can you speak more explicitly? Oh, I, just, I was just wondering if your uh, goal scripts are deployed in, like outside your cluster or inside your cluster. And if it is deploy outside, like where are you deploying it, I guess? So the question is that uh, how you execute this script? It needs oh. to be deployed or it is a command line? Thank you. Well, I assume he, he ran a command line, but I'm, I was wondering if it's deployed and if it has to be deployed. So is have you deployed this externally or is it just a command line? All we need is kubeconfig file to access the Kubernetes cluster. Right. Oh, that's not enough for distance? No, well, you can do internally. Oh, you can do it in internally and externally. Oh, okay, so you're yeah. okay. that's all I was asking. Was, are you doing it internally or are you doing it outside the cluster? 
where we just show the demo, which is out of cluster, and we can we already deployed it as a container, so you can deploy in your pod, and there's example in our GitHub repository. So, yeah. Uh, one of the challenges we have with many clusters is handling upgrades, like Kubernetes upgrades. How do you manage that with so many clusters? where we also made API for that. And we already made some live upgrade solution for this. And we share it in Korean, but we are not yet sure. We are not yet opened in English. So sorry. <laughs> sorry? GitOps? No. We cannot handle with GitOps things. We even cannot use a cluster API since our cluster has more than 7K plus, so. Uh, question here. Yeah. How do you run those scripts? Uh, is an SRE that runs the, the scripts or it can be the developer that knows to go to that site and run the scripts? Do you have a website to run those scripts? Can somebody else replace this? <laughs> Sorry. Who execute these scripts? Is it for developer or ops or is it a schedule? We do not explicitly separate those rules. So our developers deploy their manifest. We just checking if there's the problem. But before the problem, we don't know nothing. And that could be your answer. Oh. I don't want to wake up at 5 a.m. This is purposeful. Before asking me, just try this. This is its purpose. <laughs> Hey, uh, thank you for the great talk. I have a few questions about the 7,000 clusters. So um, are all those clusters created by your developers for developing and testing? Uh, how many developers do you have like, uh, using those 7,000 clusters? And how many clusters do you use actually in production services? One thing I can only say in here is that there's more cluster than our developers. <laughs> That's the only thing I can say now. Sorry? Uh, I wonder how many clusters on average per like, uh, developer use in your case? How many? How many I, I think he said that uh, there are more clusters than the developers. He cannot disclose the numbers. That's what he's saying. So I have a question. Um, yeah. So to execute this, uh, what kind of permission require for a, a developer or the uh, operation guy? Because you are seriously doing some inside information from the pod as well as the system. So it requires admin access, how the developer can use this, whether they have sufficient access to the cluster or not. Oh, so yes. You're asking me how the police to access the cluster? No, no. Is that uh, what access require for executing this? Oh, or oh, we we have uh, three uh, about three thousand developers in company, and uh, access uh, one cluster access developer about. Ten, ten to thirty. No, my is question that? is sorry. Let me repeat. My question is that to execute this is developer require admin access, yeah. or developer will work on its own namespace. Ah uh, yes, uh, we separate to uh, all cluster. So uh, cluster user is uh, gain all namespace access. Uh, 
Are you using bare metal or virtual machines for on-premise? We have our virtual machine solutions based on OpenStack. Okay. Any bare metal or just all virtual machines? Combined. Okay. Uh, what was it like working the other week during that outage uh, two weeks ago? With your data center issue where you guys were down for a couple of days or no? Do, do you have outages and if do you have outages on your data centers or on clusters? We pretty much not want to say that <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we have fire on our database database maybe last week. Last week. Yeah, last week. We were, we were very busy. <laughs> we were very busy last week, and I'm pretty much sure I'm still asleep. I want some sleep. Yep. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thanks.